The Core 360 belt is the best aid to train the abdominal wall. The Core 360 is a patent pending, first of its kind training belt that helps you move, breathe, and perform better. We use the Core 360 belt with almost every patient at Winchester Spine and Sport. The biofeedback is second to none, and it's an amazing way to teach proper respiration and can be even used during higher level movements in the gym. Teaching proper respiration is about as fun as a rash. But with the Core 360 belt, you take all the headaches away. Visit core360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% all off all belts. Ohm track sensors not included. Again, visit core360, C-O-R-E 360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% off. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, we are here in Phoenix, Arizona at the, the Diamondback Spring Training Facility with uh, Ken Crenshaw. So Ken is the Director of Sports Medicine and Performance for the Diamondbacks. Uh, you are a KG veteran in the baseball world, we'll put it that way. So this is uh, 30... 32 years. 32 uh, years uh, in, in, in baseball, Major League Baseball, which is just absolutely amazing. Uh, Brett and I always talk about staying power with people, and you definitely have that uh, in your career. And one of the things that you know the Gestalt is created around is this uh, concept of integration. Integrating different techniques, integrating different people, ways of thinking, etc. And you... I mean, you are the example. You're the OG on this. You are the example. And so, uh, you know, I I haven't been lucky enough to be around you very often, but I've heard Brett talk about you and so many other people that uh, not only do you have an amazing lineage of people, uh, you know, that have kind of gone on to do amazing things, but you've maintained yourself as the guy. Uh, And so maybe talk to us about uh, why integration is so important in a setting like this and, and kind of... I don't know, your secret sauce, yeah. I guess. Give, yeah. give us some of it. It's a great question. It's it's something that took me a long time to get to. Um, you know, I've been doing this 32 years, and I've been with four different organizations. So when you, you start thinking about, how did I actually get to where I'm at and have the concepts that we have as a, as a group? Um, and I just rewind back the things that didn't work for me, and then I start adding up the things that did work. And I think one of my first... Um, profound moments was I, I it was probably my first year when I was with the Tampa Bay Rays I realized man there's just way more power in the group than there is in me so in essence what that would mean is you know I was picking people the first year like oh I'm going to find a really good athletic trainer a really good physical therapist a really good strength and conditioning person and I picked several but I was the only guy on you know on the ground floor when they were an expansion team and I hit on about half and then the other half was like, Ugh, didn't work out. Guys were out of the game. Um, and then the next year I had taken on Ron Porterfield, actually was a, oh, yeah. a roommate of mine, and I, I hired him there. I got to pick him, and then um, we started picking together. It was like, okay, let's look through some resumes. Let's talk to some people. And we inevitably started to see that he would have a different opinion than me, but I was like, wow, I, I would have never seen that. That's cool. Um, and then... You know, we started making better decisions. They still weren't. And when I talk about people, better decisions with people. Um, so then, you know, I did that for about 10 years with Tampa and, and started to really see the power in the team. And then when I landed here in Arizona 17 years ago, I brought Nate Shaw with me from Tampa. And He's stud. Yeah, 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 we just took off and we started like, okay, let's assess the people. Because it really starts with people. Like yeah. for me, like you can have... Um, a lot of different methods. Um, you can have not a lot of principles, but some solid principles, but you can have a lot of methods. And, and if you pick the right people, you can work it. And you know that's just our bread and butter now. I'm like, if we pick the right people, it doesn't matter what method or what route we take to, to help a player perform better or stay healthy, it's gonna work because we got the right people and they're all bought into the same things. So now if, if you were gonna join our organization, like if, say you came in to interview, you're gonna get probably 10 interviews separately. We're gonna call you or Zoom you or whatever. And then we're all gonna huddle up. And I never make the decision, our team makes the decision. Is this a, is this a good person for our team? Do they fit our culture? Do, will they challenge our culture? We don't just want people that'll fit in. We want people that'll challenge. Hey, why do you guys do this? Or oh, that's why? a great point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so that's the, the cool thing that we have now. It's, and, and I just feel 
honored to be a part of the team. You know, I mean, you could say I'm the the original that, that developed it. But there was a lot of people that that helped get us to where we're at, and they continue to. You know, it's like you guys met Kelly, and, and you know, it's it's kind of her responsibility now to develop people below her, and we just have that kind of uh, accountability to each other. How long does it take now? So 32 years in, like. Is it being around somebody five minutes, you're like, oh, this is a perfect fit? Or is it like some people change? And uh, we kind of talked before we start the podcast. Um, you know, at what point are you like, this is not working out? Or like you, you know, you see the benefits in somebody and you're like, we just need to work on them. And like, what point do you cut someone loose versus, you know, just kind of train them up? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think in a couple of different spaces. First, I think selection. Like, if you select the right people, then you're going to spend way less time trying to motivate them and direct them and all yeah. that. And, it, you know, it's really uh, – um, I've got a lot of friends that are in the Navy SEALs, and, and it's they have a selection process that's pretty unique. And the system deselects them too if they're, they physically can't get through or mentally can't get through some of the stuff. So I spent a lot of time with our group just saying, hey, let's make sure our selection process is good. We would rather take – more time or, or not even hire somebody until we know we have the right person. So, you know, we have a set of like questions and things that we're asking and, and then, you know, cross checkpoints to, to figure out like, what's your work ethic? Like, I can't ask you on a telephone or a Zoom call and figure out what your work ethic is. Right. Yeah. But I'm going to ask seven or eight people that have worked with you. It may not be on your <laughs> reference list. What kind of work ethic? Because I like to me that that's one of the driving forces of, of greatness is, you know, if you don't have a work ethic, if you're not committed to excellence like the group is you're not going to fit here it's not going to work so um i think that's first the selection um and you know and then the the question to when do we decide it's not enough um i think they decide that (laughs) and i had this conversation with somebody not too long ago i feel like it was earlier day they come into our culture and you know before they get there we give them the expectations hey man we're all about you know our, our mission which is up on the walls you know we want to be the best sports medicine and performance team on the planet and we mm-hmm. chose that as a group and we're like hey man we want to set something really high a mountain that we can never quite reach but we're always striving for and below that are our values and and so before they get here we let them know these are the expectations and mm-hmm. you know if you're not good with that that's okay mm-hmm. you know this is probably not the place where you're not going to make it long and but if you are, we're going to make sure that by the time you leave, whether it's with another team or you move up in our system, that you're way better than when you started. And so, you know, when, when you set those expectations out, I think it really challenges people to say, you know what, I've seen plenty of people come in and they think they have the medal and then they start realizing, oh my gosh, like, these <laughs> dudes are really pushing it. They're really uh, an integrated group. They really work together. We just hired a new guy uh, from another team, the Padres, and he had some similar backgrounding. But he got here and he goes, man, this is the first time I've really understood what you guys talk about when you're talking about integrated a team. He goes, man, when I was with the Pi, it was like the medical and the, and the strength and conditioning weren't lined up or, you know, we have mental skills and we have nutrition, some other pieces yeah. that fit together. And I was like, great. I love to hear that yeah. like when he walks in and he identifies. And what I see in the people that don't identify with our cultures, they'll eliminate themselves. I and mean, we very rarely have to let somebody go. You know, I think part of being a great leader is is we do a, an internal eval. Um, our whole team will eval you or me. Like everybody gets eval, and and my like I'm going to get 30 opinions from my team, what I do good and what I don't do good, and how I can get better. And they're anonymous so that there's no like fear of not being able yeah. to land your your thing. And then the way we play that out is say, look, this eval is, is a gift to you from your teammates because your teammates are trying to make you the best you can possibly be. And when we, we keep building that culture of we're here to push each other, make each other best, and, and what ultimately ends winning is our player. I mean, that's what we're centered on. The player is, is the most important thing. Um, you just see people start to figure out what they're good and bad at. Yeah. And then the things they're not good at, man, they can fix right away. But... If you don't, if you have blind spots and you don't even know what they are, it's hard for you to get better. Um, so that's that's something that's been really powerful. And in their evals, like I don't, it's never the boss one-on-one eval. It's like, hey, your teammates all said this. Yeah. What do you think? And it's, it's super powerful. It's one of the most powerful things that we've we've ever done to bring awareness around what you're good and bad at. And, and that doesn't mean you're going to be great at everything. It would be like you know, if Brett's 
if we're teaching DNS today, I know what I'm good and bad at, and I know he's better than me. So he's going to run the point here. Now I'm still going to get my own reps to, to try to learn and to develop my own knowledge to his, but he's the best at this. So we all, you know, we all know who who's good and bad at what, and and we we have a thing called team ability, which is the ability to lead or the ability to follow. Um, and it's like me, I'm, I'm maybe the overall leader, but I know when it comes to PRI, I'm letting Ben or Dippy run it. They know <laughs> yeah, way right, better than right, I do. Right. So we all have that ongoing agreement that you know no. Know your strengths and weaknesses. Know when it's your turn to lead or when it's your turn to follow. That was the he had heard me talk about this a lot. Like with the teams, the debate everyone always has is, you know, do I want ten people that are exact robots of each other, or sounds like you're more in the camp of which I would be too. Is like let's let you know the stud be here. We can all do each other's job if necessary, but let's let the person shine in the area that they're. That they're strong in. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've learned that lesson a long time ago. Is if, if you try to pick uh, a clone of everything that you want that fits your your culture, part of that's good and part of it's bad. Because when I look back at, at where we're at now and how we got to where we're at, which I think is a phenomenal place, I look back the people that challenged us the most. We're a little more derelict, you know, like they didn't just come in and say, all right, I'm going to do whatever it is you guys say. They bought into team. They bought into we're going to push each other to get better. We're going to push each other outside of your comfort zone because that's when you grow. Um, it, it's the it's the Andrew Housers, the Neil Ramps, the, the Willem Kramers. The, you better say PJ. Yeah, <laughs> P, PJ. Yeah, we'll get PJ. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's when they came in and they started questioning, hey, why do you guys do that? Why is that? Or is there a better way to do it? And that's inevitably made us all grow. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I think when you pick every, you know, you want to pick people that, that have the certain principles that you stand for. You know, mine are like work ethic, passion open-mindedness can you communicate you know those are, are really big things that I look for mm-hmm. um, do they do you have all those and then we can agree on maybe a, a method like hey we're gonna use DNS or PRI or stackable mm-hmm. or whatever you know whatever whatever it is we decide um, you know that's kind of arbitrary and and it's it's unique to each player one player you know one technique may work great and mm-hmm. the next one doesn't and that's one of the things I've learned over my career is Anyone that walks in and says there's only one way to do it, I'm like immediate, like ah, yeah, not buying it. How do you define culture? Because that that's one thing that, like, when you walk in this place, even no one's here right now, you just kind of you feel like a different feeling. So, um, whether it's a business, whether it's a baseball team, yeah. I mean, how would Ken Crenshaw define culture? Because to me, it sounds like the key to the success is the culture. It is. I, I feel, and how do you implement it? Would be good. Yeah. <clears throat> now, how do we define it? Is is kind of I think you have to have a kind of a vision mission you know a direction um and then below that what are the values that we all agree upon like once we get the shared agreement like hey are we headed for that because if we are then it makes it easy for me to say hey hey taylor are you committed to being you know the best sports medicine performance team in the planet yeah yes or no and then then it's like well now are your actions showing 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 it your actions have to match your 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 words and Vice versa, you can say, hey, Ken, you know, rough day today, huh? Like, okay, you can have one, but two, you know, are you committed to being the best sports right. team on the planet? So I think you have to have a, a vision, and then you have to live live your values and live um, what you say you want to do. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of uh, John Gordon's, uh, he's, he's a good friend of mine, and he has some really good stuff around culture, and he, I think he defined it as the, the living and breathing essence of what you say and what you do. Um, wow. And I, I really, I, I believe that. Like, yeah. like it's because there's many a times I think we all know in our professions, like, oh man, okay, I don't know if I want to do that today. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but the great teams are willing to do, you know, the things that that they have to sacrifice for. Yeah. Right? We we had this talk not too long ago, me and a couple of our, our staff members, and it's like, what's the difference between somebody that's really elite and that's okay? And we're looking for really elite, and I'm like. I think it's sacrifice. Like, mm. who's willing to sacrifice, and how much are they willing to sacrifice to be good? Mm-hmm. It's like, how much are you willing to read? How much are you willing to go to a, another course? How much are you willing to step outside your comfort zone and maybe go to a communication course? Which, in in my my principles are, 
communication is the difference maker. Like you can have great skill set, but if you can't communicate it to a player or to the next clinician or whatever, eh, it's going to be limited. Mm-hmm. So, are those official meetings in your day, or is it more like you pass them in the hall and you have a quick conversation, or a little bit of both? Or no, I think collectively we meet as a group. We define what it is and redefine. We we never assume that somebody like we're going to have. I think we've got five new people into our 30 this year. Um, and we've already had some prelim meetings in the off season and like we or Zoom calls or, you know, we brought everybody together for a con ed meeting and, and we talked through them. Hey, these, everybody that's new here, these are the kind of guiding um, vision and mission that we have. And, and these are our values and, and this is why. And, you know, you don't have to agree with them, but we're telling you these are what they are. And do you disagree? And if you do, why? And then, you know, as we go, then it, it becomes a lot of uh, one-off meetings sometimes, you know. I, I look at this, my why in life is to develop people. Like, how can I develop the absolute best um, sports medicine performance people in, in, on the planet? And I'm like, that's my duty as a leader is to challenge them. I'm kind of an old coach by nature, so I'm like, I feel like you get better when people challenge you. If you never get challenged, you're not going to take that next step. Mm -hmm. So, And I want them to challenge me. I'm like, hey, as a leader, I want to be the best leader. So tell me what I do that that you think I could be better at. And, you know, we we have that kind of uh, agreement amongst us all. Like we're going to push and you got to be okay with tough conversations. And I'm going to, I might, it might be a one-off or it may not be me. Sometimes I feel like, hey, Ryan or, or, or Nate or somebody else can connect with that person better than I do then you know we'll have them do that or we'll mm-hmm. challenge these middle level leaders to hey the people below you, you you need to step out and ultimately i think leadership is is influence and it's um serving i think if you know most people they 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 want to serve themselves first it's like hey what do i got to do to get to the top and all mm-hmm. this and i think one profound shift that i've seen and made and in, in or along the way and help younger people see is if I just serve the people around me, I serve them. How can, what can I do, Brett, today to help you? What can I do, Taylor, to help you? Now, guess what? I'm going to get that back times 10 because you guys are going to believe and trust in me. Yeah. And, you know, it has to be authentic, and you have to know that I really do care about you, and, and I want to take you to an elite place. That's my guarantee when, when anyone walks in the door. I mean, I, we, were, we, were, we spend a lot of time interviewing, you know, like we had a brand-new kid the other day. He's somewhere in North Dakota. And I'm going to interview him. Like, I want to know. I'm not going to be the top guy that doesn't interview. I'm like, no, I want to know what he's about. And then I want to tell him that if you come here, I'm not, I never recruit anyone. I think recruiting people is bad. I think they, they assume that, that it's, well, they really want me, so it should be an easy ride. I'm like, no, you got to want to be here. Mm. It's, again, back to the Navy SEAL. Do you, you want to be a part of that or not? <laughs> because it's, there's sacrifice to it. And in that sacrifice, um, you know, I think they they start to see, you know, what it is that, that we expect. And and then it makes it easy for them to, to really know. I, I promise them when you leave here, no matter if it's next year, 10 years from now, you're going to be better than when you showed up. And that's my prom, my personal promise to them. And I have never had one person leave and not tell me that. Mm-hmm. So. But you're kind of always in a win-win because you've done such a good job here that people leave here people pick your guys off all the time you know Absolutely. so then but then you you get to root for a neil or a mm-hmm. pj or an andrew or like some of those people so even though maybe the, the diamondbacks aren't winning but like if you see you know one of your former trainers go on to win a world series i mean that's got to be an amazing feeling yeah it is it's uh it's an amazing feeling and a little bit of a, oh, man, I wish we were in that spot. <laughs> but, Can I see your ring? Yeah. <laughs> like, I start picking my, my World Series teams. We, we unfortunately haven't been involved in as of late in any playoff runs. But I start looking at my playoff teams. I'm like, okay, who do we have that's on that team? And I'm, I'm like, I'm rooting for that team because yeah. we had a former staff member. And, yeah, I mean, that's the, the greatest joy in life. They're like my kids. I'm yeah. like, man, you want to see them grow up and do well. and. And I always tell him, I, I was talking to Neil today and, you know, he was talking about another job opportunity and I just said, you know, I'm always here to, to help you. If, if you fail, we failed. Yeah. So we just lost one of the angels or strength and conditioning coach, Matt Tenney, took over their head job. And I said, now, Matt, you, you better feel like you can call back here any day because if you go over there and fail, then, then you just failed the whole team. Mm-hmm. All of us. Because we're responsible for developing you and I think we've done a really good job, the whole team. 
but now if, if you fail us by not checking in and you know just cross checking are your ideas good and all that then it's on it's on all of us so yeah. that's that's kind of our it sounds like behind the scenes baseball is pretty tight as far as uh, your community and uh, the people small around world. it yeah it's a really yeah. small world and I, I think that's cool it's been reflection of being around some of your students or younger people and so uh, I, I always think too I mean Brett and I we talk about it all the time I technically work for Brett but if you feel like you're a part of something that has to just continue to develop people yeah it does I mean you you feel you feel this obligation to I mean carry out your part or my part of, of the you know be the best force medicine performance team in the planet it means developing people and hopefully they get opportunities and I'd love to keep them all but Sometimes opportunities are elsewhere, but I feel like that's my biggest contribution to to our team at this point. is It's not um, guiding techniques and stuff like that. I mean, I can I can say, hey, is this the best technique, or is this you know should we try something else, or should we look at other things, which we always do. But uh, there's way more skilled people than me now. I mean, they've they've grown past me. I mean, early on, yeah, it was me and Nate were the most skilled by far with hands on and mm-hmm. exercise stuff. But now it's like, geez, what, what these young people? I can teach somebody in three years what it took me 15 to learn when I when I start looking back through, God, my roots with Leon Chetau and and Sandy Fritz and the anatomy trains that led to DNS, that led to PRI, that led you know all these routes. Mm. I'm like, <clears throat> I can teach them in three years and I don't mean not me personally but um, hey go to Brett's DNS course don't you know don't go here or you know go if Claire teaches it go there like I just streamline their learning process we have kind of a curriculum mm-hmm. uh, 100, 200, 300 it's like a college in your first year read these books go to these courses you know blah, blah, blah. and we pay for all of it and some of it's on their own but um, it just helps them streamline their process. Or is it, I mean, I'm, I'm sifting around through trying to figure out, you know, uh, I didn't run across Steckel's work till I don't know, seven, eight years ago. But right. my first 20 saw me, I had some other thoughts that worked relatively well, but it's like, well, why wouldn't you refine what you know? <laughs> so, so my obligation to the team, or I feel like my, <clears throat> my strength to the team is to, to help that, you know, grow people and see them, sure. see them through to wherever they want to go, not, now we still have to look out for our team and know that we have the best people in house, and I think we've we've really balanced that well. Like letting people get opportunities because we all got one somewhere, mm-hmm. um, and that's a hard that's a hard sell for my front office people sometimes. Like, man, we, we're losing people left and right. And I go, yeah, but I promised them when they showed up, they would be better than when they left. And I also promised them that if there's a job that they think's better for them, I might not think it's better for them, but if they think it's better for them, I'm going to help them get it. And that's a tough one. Most teams don't want to operate that way because they're afraid to lose their people. But what we've shown over the years is now we're, we're continuing to select. And it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. Mm-hmm. A lot of interviews. And, and, you know, you asked earlier, how do we how do we pick and how do we decide? Who? We, we try to not miss, but it's like when you do a, I don't even know, 2,000 interviews or however many I've done over the years, you become more proficient at that. You know what you're listening for. You know what you're looking mm-hmm. for. And you can identify it relatively quickly. Yeah. So oh, I bet you can. Yeah. Uh, let's jump into some treatment stuff. So what are we? We had a great conversation about Stecco. We were just here. We had our first experience to that system. But if you're, you know, I know you um, are very um, proficient in DNS, PRI, Stecco, dry needling. Mm-hmm. Um, what am I missing? What other things are you kind of combining? Yeah, that's a that's a, a really great question because I mean. We've probably spun off of a lot of things that we used heavily before and we've shifted out of. Um, we knew uh, some of uh, um, Antonio Spinello's work, and mm. FRC stuff, and, uh, um, you know, long stecco methods. And, you know, we've had a lot of people come to Thomas Myers, the anatomy trains, and, you know, he's a, he's a raw food by trade. And, you know, I, I learned from some incredibly talented manual people um, they were using methods, European methods. I just figured out that the American methods are behind. Mm-hmm. We're way behind where we should be. So um, we had a guy named Willem Kramer who's from the Netherlands, and he was using Syriax stuff, which is very kind of similar to the treatment mode that Stecco has. But he was treating a little different lines and stuff, but he was getting great results, and then we inherently learned it and didn't even really know why. I just started to understand the fascial system, and I'm like, 
whoa, like, okay, this is really cool. And then we hit Stecco's work and it refined it. And, and so <clears throat> I don't want to misspeak and say, you know, oh, we don't use that. But we use a lot of different things. And it really ultimately comes down to what works. Like, you know, we want, we need results. Right. Our game is all about results. So if we're not getting results, we're off of it. And what you find out is that sometimes you can use a, <clears throat> a combination of methods. Um, we're very posturally oriented. You know, we're looking at the body from a static standpoint to start with and then you know what does it do from a reciprocal movement standpoint how does that work is it working well we try to create movement efficiency and you know in the middle of all that was dns and pri and and stecco's work and and some of the anatomy trains and some neuromuscular techniques that i learned from a lady named judy delaney um leon chetau was a big influence in my my career I wrote a <clears throat> chapter in muscle energy techniques with him, and um, I don't know if you guys ever heard of him. But he's Lee Chita- oh, okay, 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 okay. I figured you. I figured this <laughs> yeah. one. Oh, every once Legend. in a while, yeah, he passed away, and now people are like, you know, younger people are like, who's that? And I'm like, oh, just he probably wrote about. <laughs> We're not well, hiring you. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he wrote every the 75 books that he's accredited to because oh. I helped him write some of them. But yeah. um, Judy Delaney worked with him, and and she lived there in St. Petersburg when I was in Tampa, and. And so, you know, when it's kind of like playing basketball with Michael Jordan. They're like, hey, you want to do a pickup game with Michael Jordan? I'm like, yeah, sure. And that was my uh, – Sandy Fritz is a lady who's a manual therapist up in the, um, the Michigan area, Detroit, Michigan area. She allowed me – I met her down at the IMG Academies in Bradenton when I lived down there. And she introduced me to Leon. And, man, Leon, you know, said, hey, would you mind writing a chapter in the book? And I'm like, I've never wrote anything. But sure, I'll do it. <laughs> yes, but no. Yeah, it's, like a, it's like a pickup game with Michael Jordan. You know you're going to get worked, but you're like, I don't care. Yeah, right. I can tell everybody <laughs> Worth it with Michael. Worth it. So, yeah, once I, I met him, man, he opened so many doors for me to, to other um, people that I'm probably drawing a blank on, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's like to, to take all of that and mix it together – it's, that's when I think you can really become a, a good clinician. This is uh, a real good time to ask this question. I've been wanting to ask you this for a while. So how do you, you know, still give credence to, you know, obviously you can't have Pavel Kolaj here. You can't have Ron Ruska here. You can't mm-hmm. have Antonio Steco here. So how do you not, we use the term bastardize. Mm-hmm. So in like in our office, what we always work on is like, we may not be doing things exactly yeah. like they are, but if they were in the office, Stu McGill might walk over and he'd be proud of what we're doing. It may not be exactly what he's doing, yeah. but it's, so how do you, you know, balance that? Cause I mean, I think that's the key to integration where, Absolutely. cause we all know in every technique there's fluff, you mm-hmm. know, like, so how do you just cut to the, to the point? I know you said results, but is there anything else you do to kind of, yeah, I think I think that's your experience, isn't mm-hmm. it? I mean, like, um, I know there's purists in every field. Warren yeah. Weisbrod, good friend in town, and <laughs> sometimes like he's a purist, man. And I know yeah. he 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 knows a lot of stuff about DNS, and then I would, you know, my my offshoot to that would be, well, let's ask Brett what he thinks, and let's ask Alan Rintala what he thinks, and let's ask you know other people to see what they're doing that works and. Or Claire. I mean, use Claire a lot. She comes yeah. in and talks some questions. Oh, she's great. Yeah. So um, it's it's sifting down because every method evolves too. I'm mm-hmm. sure if you ask, you know, Yonder or Pavel, I mean, they would tell you something. In Stecco's work, it's changed in yeah. the last two or three years. I'm like, well, there's another point here. So I think every method evolves, but it's when you have to evolve it, <clears throat> you have to understand the patient population you're working with. I mean, we're working with top end athletes. And so sometimes. You know, I can go work with with a 65-year-old grandma and I can get some really quick results. Or, you know, a young kid that's never had any kind of therapy, boom, it's quick. Those are the easy ones. Yeah. It's when you have a finely tuned athlete that sometimes you're like, whoa, okay, now we we got to really think outside the box here and let's try another technique or whatever. So um, I, I hate to say it, but it's, it's really about results and experience. And the beauty is we have a collective experience between, um, you know, our upper mm-hmm. veteran guys, me and and Ryan and Nate and Ben, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot. Oh, those are Junko Yazawa, yeah, yeah, she's yeah. she's a very uh, she's down the Eldoa. Uh, oh yeah. So I've you know I've done some of that too. Um, so it's taking all of us together and setting down. That's the coolest thing that we probably have that you guys may not have is like we got that group every day. Right. Yeah. We get to sit down and go, hey, we have this problem. 
and we can't solve it with the, hey, what do you guys think? Or, you know, we get to brain, brainstorm about those, and that's, that's really cool. That's one of the, the things that really keeps me coming back to go, wow, man, what a special team, you know? I think, you also, oh, go ahead. I, I think you are, just answered the question, but then maybe a better question is, how do you integrate that into a team setting like you have down so many levels? Yeah. So, like, you know, you, we have, you have someone new come in, you, you learn something yeah. new, and then how, how do you actually create the implementation to, to yeah. get that at all Well, levels? you have a hierarchy because you got, you know, double A, single A, you know, like yeah. it's got to go all the way through. It does, but I mean, you're inherently going to have people that are brand new that just showed up a month ago to people that have been here eight or nine years, yeah. and um, they generally will fall into that hierarchical standard, but I think what I see works the best is that I, when I was with the Braves, uh, we had uh, <clears throat> Tom Glavin and John Smoltz and Greg Maddox. And, bunch of nobodies. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of nobodies. <laughs> and they would come to the weight room, and I was in charge of the oh, strength of the and It was just like... Um, you know, we were we were fumbling around me and the, the, another guy that was a strength coach with us. And, and but man, those guys were going out in the field and just doing damage, and they were healthy and they were doing all these things. So everybody's like, "What are you guys doing?" I'm like, oh, "We're just trying not to hurt them." You know? <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing a thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we had this kind of saying that we came up with: just don't do stupid shit. <laughs> we put it on the wall. Uh, uh, don't do yeah DDSS, and everybody's like, "What's that?" Well, just don't do stupid shit. And so anyway, that was before we kind of understood some of the, the stuff that we know now. But it was like every minor league pitcher would walk into the weight room and go, "All right, what am I supposed to do?" And I go, uh, "You know, do this." And they may have a little pushback. Well, my college, and I go, "Well, I don't know. Maddox is doing it. Does that work for you?" <laughs> <laughs> and it was automatic win. You, we win every time. It was such an easy uh, process for me. Now. I had to move on to, you know, Tampa was a bit of a struggle to go, okay, hey, how do I get somebody to follow through? Yeah. But what what our people have here is, um, we were talking about this earlier, is, you know, how do you learn leadership or how do you learn a new technique? Well, you learn it from people that do it really well. You want to study elite people. And you also can study people that aren't elite and go, ah, don't do that. You know, it's important <laughs> to know what not to do as it is what to do. And so... Man, we have such elite people. Like, I, I get mesmerized sitting here sometimes watching Ben and Ryan, or even the young people sometimes. They're like, wow, what a creative idea. Like, where'd you get that? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I was, you guys told me this, and they kind of spun it off into their own idea, which is like, does it get results? Yeah, okay. So so I think uh, when, when you have these, these younger people and your older people are very experienced and they get results, mm. now, if they're not getting the results, these younger people aren't going to go. You know, like, it's like, what, what is Maddox doing? Well, he's won 20 games and a couple of Cy Youngs. You know, okay, I'm doing it. Yeah. That's kind of what we have here. We have such elite people, and I've been able to kind of retain, you know, some of our top people for quite a while. And, man, our young people just grow. Like, it's amazing what they can be taught. I'm, I'm kind of – I teach, like, simple stuff, like leadership and communication. And, <laughs> and, you know, can I teach you stuff about DNS? Yeah, I can teach you the, the, the principles and all that, but – or PRI or, or STECO, yeah, I can teach you that, but not to the level that some of our people can do. And then I think that's what grows our younger people. Yeah, that's brilliant. So we've talked about um, integration with the staff. Now, how do we get buy-in with the players? Like, Because I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Before we turn this on, we were kind of talking about every player now has their team on the outside, and you have a lot of people who are uh, affecting the treatment or the training. So... Um, what do you do? Like a new player gets traded, and they're now you know part of the team. Like, what do you say initially to get buy-in from them to trust you and yeah. you know have good rapport? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you <clears throat> what you first do, depending on who the player is, what his history's been. You know, if uh, a Zach Greenkey, a Madison Bumgarner, I'm I'm just asking, well, hey, what have you guys been doing? Because you've been kicking butt. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to know. Maybe I can learn from you. Sure. I don't think none of us have the intention that, hey, we're going to change this guy's world mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he's coming to a new system, a new place. We've got a lot of not-so-mainstream ideas, according to some people. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, what's PRR? What's DNS? What are, you know, I'm like, so what I do is watch, you know, or, you know, ask them what their experiences are. Where do they want to go? Like, you know, what what are you out to do? Um, I think when you, you start on that side of the fence and you, you just develop a relationship first with them and they know that you're not there to boss them around and tell them, you know, I'm not going to tell Zach Greenkey how to work out. The guy's, you know, one of the best pitchers in the game and has one of the top active win records or uh, win records going. So I'm like, I want to ask him. Maybe I can learn. 
and then you look at guy. There's a guy that's been hurt a whole bunch, and I'm like, okay, hey, let's let's sit down and talk about what you've done and why. Maybe why? Maybe there's a why that it's happening. You know, maybe your pattern patterning's off. Maybe we could correct that. Help you out there. Um, but I think it's first getting on the side of the fence with them, asking them where they want to go, what they want to do. And I heard a great comment the other day by a guy named Donnie Ecker, who's a, he was a hitting coach at, with the Giants last year. Now he's with the, the Rangers as their bench coach at hitting. And he's just a phenomenally smart guy. And, um, uh, I, first time I met him the other day, but I have friends that know him really well. And, and I saw a video one time of him. He's a hitting coach talking about rib cage and, and pelvic position and how they need to be stacked. And this hitter, we were struggling with this hitter because he was extended. He's a very extended bias guy. And it was, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, he's a hitting coach talking about that. I really like this guy. But we were on a hitting panel the other day, and um, and he said, you know, I really asked them what they want to do, where they want to go. Like, he asked hitters, like, hey, what do you want to do? Well, I want to be better than I was or whatever I want to do. And he goes, okay, cool. Now, are you okay with me holding you accountable to that? Hmm. You know, that's the second permission slip you got to get. Are you okay with me holding you accountable to it? And then he said third and most important is you better know your shit. Hmm. Like, you better have good knowledge. And I, I would tell you guys, like, a new player walks into our organization, they know immediately, well, maybe not immediately, but it takes them not long to figure out, man, these guys have dedicated and committed themselves to learning. We're open-minded. We, we do all the things that we stand for, and I think they just, that, that gets around. And then inevitably what I hear is we'll have players that come from other teams that are like, man, this is the best place I've ever been with, you know, as far as the medical and performance. And I'm like, I love to hear that. Mm -hmm. Now we got to back that up and, right. and try to get you guys performing like you should. And then that carries too. Those players will go somewhere else, veteran guys, and like, man, those guys. So I think that's <clears> – <throat> we've committed the time. We've sacrificed um, the effort to be good. And, and I think the paths that we've dug are, are good ones. And they're not mainstream ones, the DNS route or the PRR or the Stecco. They're, they're all productive routes but they still require sacrifice. And I think that that sacrifice, players really appreciate that. I have a saying of players, they, they only care about three things. Can I trust you? Do you care about me? And do you have something that will help me? Hmm. That's it. They don't care about anything else. They don't really care about your family or whatever. <laughs> they, 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 they hear in your voice, can I trust this guy? Yeah. Uh, does he care about me? And does he have something that can help me? And that that has something that can help me, that's when the sacrifice is on our side of the fence and we got to work at it. And, and that's what I preach to our young people. Like, if you're going to work at the very top level or be an elite clinician, man, it takes work and mm -hmm. sacrifice and hands-on and it's learning these things. But nobody can do that but you. I can't force you to do that. you got to figure that out. How do you combat, um, and this is a problem in all professional sports, really a problem in baseball with every team, um, where an athlete comes in and they want to kind of a la carte their treatment. You know, they think they know. So at the end of the day, they've been manipulated. They've had an hour massage. They've trained. They're wanting to be dry needled. They're sitting in a, you know, whatever. I mean, whatever the new gadget is. So who is there and how do you do a good job, Ken? Because I know um, you do such a good job of this. How do you, like tell the player this is your plan therefore like because they think that's what they need but like I always feel like some days like people are just like logging hours at the stadium and it's like how do you make that all constructive for them with the plan yeah it's a, another great question it's like uh, what we want to do <clears throat> before we even start is huddle up know what each other's good and bad at um, you know it's like if somebody comes in and they're really patterned up strong a certain way then then if I'm directing traffic that day, um, just, you know, I don't direct as much. It's more Ryan or someone or Ben and Nate. And it'll be like, <clears throat> hey, I think you should go to Nate. Um, you know, we, we instinctively or uninstinctively, we, we know who's the best at what. And we have no ego about We just want to get our player better and out on that thing. So so we'll direct traffic a little bit that way, which is unique. And we got a very veteran sports medicine performance team, so we can do that. Um, but I think it's a great, great question because most players who come in and a lot of them like to be passive care. Let me just lay on the table and mm -hmm. do nothing. And it's like, well, wait, are you getting results or are you hurt all the time? Maybe you need to take an active pursuit to this. And so we, we hold them accountable too. And there's tough conversations in some of that. And I think there's a, there's a really fine art. And I, that's where I was telling you guys, I think communication is the difference maker. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if I can responsibly use 
my words or my communication to um, challenge this guy to get him to see that maybe the methods he's using aren't being the most productive for him, then I'm okay with doing it. And that's a tough place for a lot of younger people to be, oh man, I'm going to challenge this guy. Well, you're not, but you learn how to do it responsibly and you, you learn how to challenge players. And, and you know, that, that to us has been really productive. And sometimes you get players that are going to do whatever they want to do. And, and I think the the proof's in the pudding. Like, are they healthy or are they performing good? Because that ultimately is the end game. Golf is interesting because golf a lot of times, like, leads the way in the tech world. Mm-hmm. So what's happening now in golf is a lot of, like, the the coaches who are working with players, like, they're kind of like, there's been a little bit of a, a backing off of all the tech. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, five years ago, it was all about tech. So and I think baseball's kind of in that phase now. So how do you balance, I mean, all of this objective data that you have access to, how do you actually utilize it without actually creating, like, a constraint to performance? Yeah, and- yeah solid question. Uh, you know, like, I, I operate out of two spaces, and one of them is um, what's real and what what's feel and you know uh, kind of a Eugene Bleeker thought like hey is the the real is the objective data on the other end my spin rate is this or my exit velocity is this or whatever it is but those numbers are produced by a person on the other end right and <clears throat> if that person can get the feel of how to move efficiently and, and what it it feels like and or maybe the drills or whatever it takes or the mindset that takes to get him to to move efficiently, <clears throat> then we can bridge the gap in between those those two. And I think that's where <clears throat> there's been a little bit of this kind of old school versus new school, like, oh, well, these guys are all new school and analytics, and they, they, you know, they're wrong, and the old school or the new school guys are like, these guys are all wrong, they're all old school. <clears throat> I think they're all both right and wrong. Mm. And it's just getting out of that space of what's right and what's wrong. Like we used to call spin rate life. On the fat, wow, that guy's got a lot of life on his fastball. Mariano Rivera's got a lot of life. We never talk about spin, right? <laughs> so, so it's kind of like it's like the technology that's advanced in our in our world is like, <clears throat> you know, where where um, is that that understanding of what it actually means, and then you know what's going to relate with a player? Like I tell coaches all the time, I'm like, you know, a lot of old school coaches are like, well, I'm just going to use my eye. And I'm like, man, I've been around some of the most gifted people in the world that use their eyes, a Pavel, a a Dan Path. Man, incredible set of eyes. And then everybody's like, well, I don't know. I can't see it. And then, well, what do you do if you can't see it at the same speed he can? Oh, we got video cameras now. Like, just pull it out and look at it. I'm like, it's so simple. So, like, I don't even trust my own eye at times i'm like no i want to see it i want to see it so so it's that's a simple analogy for sometimes like uh, young people or coaches it's like hey look how you're using tech too it's just you know not the level of some of it can can get but you can't get so objective that that on the other end we can't produce a feel that's going to create those objective numbers this is what i think is it hard to find people who are good at taking tech information and then directly applying it to the player? I mean, because you have the people that are good at gathering yeah. the data, of course, and analyzing it. But then, you know, having that crossover has got to be a challenge. But you found that there's people that are just amazing at that. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a lot. I think I think what happens is objective people... I'm not a real objective guy. I, I like objective things to prove that maybe what I'm doing is right or wrong. Mm-hmm. I think that's the way I use it, and I think it's the way it should be used. But objective fee- people are very, hey, it's got to be this way because it says it's supposed to be. I'm like, well, wait a minute. The, the, what if the guy feels bad today, he's sick today, or whatever? Those objective numbers aren't going to be the same based off of some physiology happening over here. So I try to blend the understanding of, the physiology is going to create the objectiveness at times. Mm-hmm. So is it um, understanding that that we don't want to be so objective that we're missing the feel on the other end of it? And and so I think the feel on the other end is very – it's subjective and it's art. Mm-hmm. And that's where the coaches 
pop in and it's like, well, yeah, you need an artist and you don't want to tell him how to paint his picture because I think that's what's happening. Sometimes the objective people are saying, hey, you need to paint the picture this way. It's got to be A, B, C, and D. And he's like, well, no, I'm an artist. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I always like try to question coaches. Hey, well, how are you cueing them? Or is it actually getting the result that you want? And now you can prove it with mm -hmm. the objective stuff. Like, oh, well, a spin just jumped up 100 you know, RPMs because I told him to get into his back leg more or something. Mm -hmm. I think that's a cool thing that, yeah. that's happening. I, I, I think it's great. We just don't want to get to one too far to one end of the spectrum. We were talking about that before the start, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> right it's, now? It's, yeah, it's just another data point, right? right? Like it's just another no different than if you give an exam. Yeah. I mean the subjectiveness of an exam, you need some I mean, we talked to Stecco this weekend, we're learning about that you want some feedback, but you also mm -hmm. have to rely on what you're feeling yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Tell us uh I mean some of the stories about Greg Maddox are just legendary about his like daily process that he went through and just not like the physical side of pitching, but the mental side. Um, being around those three, I mean, what, what were some of the things? I'm assuming they all made each other better. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I, I was really young in my career, too. It was my, my first year as a strength and conditioning oh, wow. coach. And I was with the Braves. And, and, and Maddox wasn't there then, but Smoltz and Glavin were. And I'm just the young buck on the wall, you know. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. wow, Deion Sanders. And I, I'm kind of mesmerized, to be honest. I was three years out of yeah. college. And, uh, you know, I just – what I saw there was guys that challenged each other that were really smart, um, very well thought out. Um, they were very uh, principled. And, and then they, they pushed each other to, you know, if it was like conditioning. But they trusted in us. And, and man, I'm, days I'm sitting there going, woo, I hope we're giving them the right stuff. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think, again, we were avoiding doing things that would, like, probably pattern guys up. That, that I know now, I'm like, oh man, I'm making them really extension dominant. We just, I don't know if we were just lucky or we just figured out, don't do that. Um, and I think those those roots helped us a lot. But yeah, they were incredible guy. I mean, I always say they didn't need a pitching coach; they coach themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, but those guys are unique. You just don't mm -hmm. see guys like that. And you know, I've been lucky to Randy Johnson and, and some other like Max Scherzer's and some other guys that I've I've had along my path and. You know, I just I ask questions, man. I want to see why they do what they do, and and see you know their physiology and how it all plays out in the end. One of the seminars we were all teaching at, I remember uh, someone asked Nate. They said, uh, "Your strength conditioning mm -hmm. specialist." They said, um, "What is the most important thing that you can do?" And he said something I'll never forget. He said, "The most important thing that I have to do is not blow somebody up." Yeah. So, which is hard because I would imagine like all these people are trying to impress you. They're trying to like make a difference. So that there's a very, I mean, that's probably a razor's edge there of yeah. not blowing someone up, but still like making your mark with the team and, you know, showing that you're moving, have something to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and especially in the, in the performance world, um, I had some really good influence way back when I first started from Vern Gambetta. Oh, sure. Um, you know, kind of a legendary track coach and. And he was with the White Sox, and, you know, I would watch from afar, but I just knew I was kind of a track and field guy from afar, too. And I was like, man, I really liked what he was doing, so I would just try to steal off the edge. And, you know, I finally had a couple meetings, and um, he probably didn't know who I was. And I was like, whoa, who's this guy? So you know, I would I would just pick his brain, and, and I thought he was really um, astute about quality movement and – and, and they seem to be really healthy. I mean, back then we didn't have the objective numbers, mm -hmm. but I implemented a lot of those things when I was with the Braves and the minor leagues. And man, we just we didn't have a whole lot of guys hurt, and we had some tremendous players. So uh, I reflect on that, and I go, man, we just weren't weren't doing anything bad and blowing guys up. And and when I think back on it, you know, strength and conditioning is is uh, it's driven by like. Like more, and Bern Gambetta wrote an article that said, "How much strength is enough?" <laughs> so if you can squat 400, do you think if you squat 600, it's going to make you throw better or hit better? <laughs> and, and it made a ton of sense to me. I'm yeah, like, yeah. he goes, "No, but you're really increasing the risk of the spinal load by putting 600." But I really don't think that it's going to make you that much better. that much better. And I'm like, wow. And we actually give that to all of our new people. I'm like, because you know we're going to have a lot of people that come through college programs and are like. And we got to load this bar up and we got to get it going. And, mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, if I took all of the players that I've had that were super strong or really good weightlifters and then took all the players that I, I had that were really good players, Hall of Fame players, which I've been lucky to have a lot, it doesn't correlate. 
It just doesn't. I mean, strength is important to a degree, but quality movement and um, just understanding how maybe certain patterns will drive certain movements, I think that's where the gold's at for me personally. Um, so I, I've probably, I'm not, I mean, I'm pro strength and conditioning, but I'm pro strength and conditioning the things that actually need to be strength and conditioning that are specific to a baseball player or pitcher or hitter. Or that's really well said. Yeah, that's yeah. really, yeah. Um, when we were uh, with each other in St. Louis, your presentation, I almost felt like I was at a staff meeting, basically. So, and I know um, some of the people who have inspired you are like Bill Belichick. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm assuming like a Nick Saban. Oh, like, what um, what do they do that you like? Like, because yeah. in your talk, you were kind of referencing them. So, like, what are yeah. some of those things? Yeah, it's like anything. If you want to um, be an elite hitting coach, study elite players. If you want to be an elite, you know, clinician in, in the sports medicine world, study elite people. Um, I think if you want to be an elite leader, study elite leaders. Um, but I've always been intrigued uh, since I was a little kid about like people that are great. Like, like how does, how do the Patriots and we're living it again. It's like, man, they, they look like they were dead in the water and now they're good again. <laughs> and you know, Greg Popovich and, and you know Nick Saban and you know like whatever I mean I've got a lot of like kind of idle people that I I look I had a high school coach in basketball and he just everywhere he went he won and so I learned I went and coached with him afterwards and I just learned he had a system I'm a big John Wooden guy he's one of my favorite and so he was a John Wooden guy so he always taught us principles you know I still remember the top of the pyramid uh, competitive greatness (laughs) playing your best when it's when your best is called for and uh, so I've always been intrigued by coaches that that can do it over and over and over consensus or consistency is something that really beats to my heart Mm -hmm. um i grew up on a cattle ranch and and you had to be consistent like every day you got to get up and feed the cows and the horses and the and every night you had to feed them and and then sundays weren't off and it was just um that was our lifestyle and and so i think when you dig through i I was reading a book about nick saban uh, the other night and he, you know, he grew up in West Virginia, and his dad owned a gas station, and he just learned there that consistency. And like, his dad would make him wash cars and pay him ten cents a car, and if it wasn't washed well, he'd make him do it again. And it was just hmm. these little consistent things. And when I listened to, uh, we've actually had Bill Belichick; he was good friends with Tony Larusa, so he's come in yeah. and spoke to our team. And you know, I got a little sidebar with him, and then I. Uh, uh, Josh McDaniels, I think his name. Yeah, uh, he he was with him, and and so I pull him off the side. Hey, what are the key things that Bill preaches? And I'm like, just don't turn the football over. Like if, if we don't, and he explained it to me, and I'm like, wow, that's simple. <laughs> and I think what I found out was all of these people that are consistently good, and they can produce these cultures where where they obviously had good players, but they do something that's just better than other people. So I'm like, I want to see what they do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, Bill Belichick has the saying, just do your job. Mm -hmm. But he's also been really clear, given everybody the expectations, showed them how to do his job. Because I've read before, he knows every position better than each position coach. (laughs) And I think Saban's probably the same way. Like they'll, they lose coaches left and right. And those guys, the new guy comes in and they never miss a beat because I think they have a system Mm -hmm. That's set up, and I, I kind of modeled our stuff after that. I, I speak in terms of systems intelligence, not emotional intelligence, and mm-hmm. just you know IQ and, and EQ, and then I call it SQ, uh, systems intelligence. Is your system working good together, and is everybody kind of doing their job well, mm-hmm. and then the team will will play better together. And that's what I see in in him, or you know, just any any coach that can reproduce. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at the pro level. It's just harder at the pro level because Guys have more money and you know, bigger egos and blah, 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 blah. So I'm more intrigued by, wow, how can that guy get the pro guys to do that? Versus well, the margin of error is yeah. you know, so much different. Than the- or like your guys are getting picked off, so then you yeah. got to reload. So like Nick Saban, um, Belichick, yourself, like you'll – when you lose somebody, the system still goes on. you know. And then, and then the other interesting thing, look at it the other way, sometimes like the people leave – and this is happening a lot to Belichick. Mm-hmm. You think his assistants are going to go on and, oh, they're going to win three Super Bowls. No, they get away from the system, and mm-hmm. they're not who they were. It's kind of like Michael Jordan and Pippen, you know. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, so. We, we've had the same issues at times. 
the beauty is I get to cross check, hey, what's going on over there? And, and you'll find out maybe we send a, a medical person out and then they don't, they're not aligned or integrated very well with uh, the strength and conditioning people. Mm-hmm. So they only have one side of the equation. And we always say, well, the mothership doesn't have that. Like yeah. we're all on the same page and all on the same team and, and, and they don't, or we'll send a strength and conditioning guy and he'll figure out, man, I can't, I'm not connecting with the trainers and we're not on the same team. And, and so I, I hear that and I'm like, okay, what we got is good. Let's, let's make it better. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the way you got to think about it and learn and, and grow that way. Oh, yeah. So 30, 30 years into this, uh, you still have passion. Obviously you still are a learner. Uh, what's what's the next ten years for for Ken Krenza? I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, there was a period about a year or two ago, maybe a little longer. It was, it was actually before COVID. I was starting to to kind of question myself, like I don't want to stand in the way of of people that are are moving up. But I really got to this point where um, you mentioned it, like. Um, I want to leave the legacy when I leave that this place is better than when I showed up. And I know if I left right now, I can honestly say that, but I continuously come to work and I feel like we had a talk yesterday with Ryan. I said, Hey, I want, I want you and others to think, what if I'm not here? How do you push yourself? How do you push each other? Like, I think if you ever lose that, we won't be who we are. And so I challenged them in that, like, like, in just specific instances, like I want them to think for themselves. Now I know I, I think outside the box sometimes, and I'll push, you know, stuff like, hey, let's try this or let's do that, and I can do that because of my position. But I think there's more power in the team when they can start coming up with their own ideas and and say, hey, look, what about this, and you know, and run it through the right channel so that they're not just rogue running out there, um, but. It was a couple of years ago. I was I was kind of struggling with should I keep doing this and and I just man I, I hit a new gear and then uh, COVID showed up and I was like <laughs> oh my gosh this is killing our our connectivity like mm-hmm. what we really thrive on is working together sitting down in a, as a group and mm-hmm. and and asking tough questions and really getting to know each other and crying and and sharing together you know that's the kind of group we are like we're okay with. We, I want to know everything I can about you because that helps me help you. Like, who, who's your family? You know, what drives you? What, you know, what are your passions? Um, and I think, man, that kind of reinvigorated me. And then this year, uh, um, Mike Hayes and our, our GM, and he's he's kind of allowed me to do some stuff with coaches. And I feel like that's my my gift is is I'm a I'm an old coach, yeah. um, basketball coach that I, I learned back. I coached about 20 years of youth stuff, and then I coach with my high school coach, and his motto always was you know my job as a coach is to get you to play better than you ever thought you could be and he goes there's so few kids that I'm going to be able to do that to but if I can do that then I feel successful and Mm -hmm. and you know he was he was looking at 10 15 new kids every year but that was his mindset if I can help two of these to be better than they ever thought they could be and he did that for me he changed my life and Mm -hmm. so I'm like I just want to keep giving that gift to, to somebody else. Have you heard that story about John Wooden where the first practice, they spend three hours teaching them how to tie their shoes. Tie your shoes. They question them, they're like, if your shoe's not tied, you can't play good yes. basketball. Yeah. And I think it's just like the, the details, right? <laughs> the devil's in the details. You, you would, you would, you'd be shocked. I told my, my kids this the other day. I got three kids that are in college, and, and I, I mean, we were doing something, and one of them I didn't bring his glove or whatever. Well, I didn't, I'm like – I mean, you gotta be prepared. And we kind of went to the John Wooden thing because I've always told all my kids this. You know, I said, you know what John Wooden did? He used to make the guys put their socks on first because if your socks wrinkled up and you get a blister, then you can't practice. And if your shoes not tight, and I said, look, that's the mentality that I'm working out of because I think that those are the difference makers. I think some people get so complicated they want to. Man, I got a, I got a DNS, you know, 14 flips underneath and. Wait, wait, well, hold on. I, I'm a basketball coach. Can you shoot, pass, catch, dribble, and play defense? Yeah. Like, can you do those five things good? If you do those five things well, those those fundamentals, everything else is going to take care of itself. So, so even in my teachings and, and my relationships with with my people, I'm like, well, do the fundamentals well because what they'll do is they'll inevitably walk in and they'll see Ben or Ryan or Nate or or me doing maybe something that's advanced, and they're like, man, I want to get right to there. Yeah, but. Do you realize all of the years that that Ben and Ryan and Nate have spent oh, yeah. to to just mm-hmm. get the basics? And so we always fight that problem. Like we we have to be like, okay, no, 
we got to go back. And that's a Bill Belichick. When you listen, um, he starts at zero every year. Um, I know we're wrapping up, but I, one thing I really want to ask you is, do you do, like, on a daily basis, like a grand round situation so you know a player's been injured? Like, do you guys all meet together and kind of get feedback from everyone and then make a decision and then implement the plan? Or is it not that no, tightly we're going to No, I'm – and this is probably one of my when I get evaluated, some of the people say, "Well, man, I wish you'd just tell us what to do." And I'm, I, I've always fought that. I'm like, I was kind of taught it's way more powerful when you learn what to do mm-hmm. versus me telling you what to do. Um, so there's days that yeah, we'll you know if we have multiple rehab guys, we, we kind of have a chart. We'll we'll sit down and somebody will take the lead on it and go, "All right, here I'm gonna I'm gonna you know write down the things that they're going to do when they come in just so everybody's coordinated when yeah. the player shows up or not hey what are we doing with this guy um but i think sometimes we we share that duty mm-hmm. and i think that just builds power in the team to say hey you know maybe ben's going to run the point today or ryan's going to run the point or ryan or junko or whoever it is they they take the lead i like that um it's a little scary for some people because it's <laughs> the objective people want to be told what to do and i want them to think um, so some days we do, yeah. um, some days we don't. Or if we do, it'll be a big 10,000-foot uh, uh, view. Hey, look, we want to get this guy. In 10 days, we want to have him here or whatever. Up to you to decide what to do in that yeah, I don't. I never yeah. tell them to yeah. use this technique or that technique. I'm just We start trying to match <clears throat> up uh, uh, personalities and energies mm-hmm. and who, who has the best technique that may fit for this guy. I mean, we talk about that. And, like, you know, I think Ben – or, or maybe, maybe – that guy has a good relationship with the player. I think that's important because mm-hmm. players will come in and they'll instinctively look for the guy that their guy. Mm-hmm. And but I always will tell them everybody can't be lined up for one guy. Like we got to get players trained that hey, you might go to this guy or that guy. So mm-hmm. right, girl. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's awesome. What what a cool conversation. I mean, I, I think my big takeaways is is leadership is a continuous process. You know, it's such a cool thing to be able to be around people that are continuing to learn and and uh, to integrate other people. And so uh, I think what makes a, such a good leader is listening to you talk today is that you truly do care about the people below you. Like you really actually want people yeah. to succeed. And, and uh, I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to be that for our patients, for our players, for whatever that is. And so I think if you just continually every single day see what you can do to make yeah. yourself better than the people around you, I mean, holy cow, look at the legacy that you built. And I think that's pretty special. So No, I, I appreciate you know just the, those words and – and it does. It's it's a consistent, relentless effort, and I think that's what I'm good at. Like yeah. We have we talk about it a lot. Some people are like, go out hard as you can. And I'm like, no, I just plug away each day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I try to read and learn and, and grow myself, and and you know, ask for feedback from my own people, and like, how can I get better? How can I help you? And it's really a servant leader. Like that's that's my leadership style. I want to serve you. And, it's gritty. And if you can really get to that space with yourself. And with your people, man, the rewards that are coming back are, are immense. Well, what you created too, and you don't find this often in business or companies or teams, is where people are not uh, being punished for being great, which is really weird. Like a lot of times in certain situations, people can be performing really well, and because the system's not set up well, they're actually like you know punished for that actually, yeah, yeah. and it's kind of a really weird thing. So creating culture to where everybody can just you know go Explore. be a superstar is uh, I think I should be commended. You got to create safety for them, you know. And everybody really, if you boil it down, they want expectations and clarity is what they're supposed to do. Most people are like, okay, tell me what to do, and, and you know I'm going to do the job. I want my people to think outside of that, but I also want them to have safety and in, in knowing that hey, I can do this and. Ken or whoever's not down my throat. Like, he's got my back. He's got my back. Yeah. Like yeah. now, if they they fumble a little bit, we might pull off the side and go, "Hey, look, there's probably a better way to do that." You know, or if you're you're in doubt, come and ask me before, or you know, ask somebody yeah. that, that's been through that before before you step on the bomb there. You know, and yeah. openness to be able yeah. to approach you or approach yeah. somebody else, and the humbleness to ask a question. Yeah, I think I think I instinctively had a lot of these that I've learned from other leaders, but then I start reading mm-hmm. some of the. The book works now. It's psychological safety. If you have that, that's a great culture. And I'm like, yeah, I want to provide that for people because that's what I would want. I would mm-hmm. want to, and I wasn't always in those environments. I've had plenty of GMs that are, I mean, hooting and hollering, and you're just like you're feeling the heat, you mm-hmm. know. And mm-hmm. you're not going to perform your best when you're just on, right. on edges. So mm-hmm. um, there's a there's a book called Talent War. I don't know if you guys have yep. heard it. Awesome book. And, and you know, some Navy SEAL guys I think wrote it, and, and just a beautiful way of looking at how to pick 
and select people that when I read it, I'm like, yeah, we kind of do all that, which is cool, you know, yeah. just to, to cross check your own ideas and know that maybe there's other people that are getting really successful um, things that, are, that you're doing. But I know in the end, they all take effort and sacrifice. And that's that's the difference, too. Sometimes people aren't willing to sacrifice and, and do a thousand interviews of intern candidates and i and i'm like no that's the difference that's what makes us good is we're all going to do that and hey get prepared because it's you know nightly interviews with potential interns is where we have to start on the very lowest level maybe to close out uh one book that you're reading recently that's really uh impacted you and then do you have any favorite podcasts that you kind of uh, go through yeah one book i mean I, I try to read a book and um, audio book too at the same time I always yeah. have two books going so I do a lot I always serve you know um, great leaders or great readers and, yeah. and I'm like man I really want to do that so I, I do that a lot um, and I, I came across a book called Why the Best are the Best from Kevin Eastman mm. um, he was a coach with the Boston Celtics who I was or am a Celtics fan and, and man he's just got some super solid simple principles I'm a simple guy too I think I think there's um simplicity is greatness and you know sophistication can create confusion <clears throat> so i'm a very simple guy but that would be one um podcasts i listen to a lot of different ones i really uh simon sinek's got some tremendous mm-hmm. stuff that just makes you think yeah. you know outside you know of, of what you're thinking i really i like a lot of his stuff and just the way he he thinks um Change the Game Project and a guy named John O'Sullivan has some, some good stuff that's kind of related to coaching and things sure. like that. I mean, I listen to a lot of different podcasts, but those are the ones that just popped to my mind. I love it. Awesome. There's brilliance and simplicity, isn't it? And I mean, brilliance, that's integration, uh, right? That's being able to look at a difficult, complex technique or whatever it is and be able to like break it down yeah. into the... Yeah. Nuts in the actionable way. steps. Uh, you got a bunch of pros around you, so I just want to give a, a shout-out to Ben, uh, Ryan... Uh, Nate, I mean, they're just, you just got such a good team. And it's funny, like, when you guys are together, you're together. Like, it's like lockstep. You you have the same outfits on. You, you know, you, you just, it's it's impressive. So yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're the guys that make me. So, you know, I never want to be the guy taking all the credit. I mean, I'm, I'm the guy that kind of gives the boat a little guidance. But, man, they're the ones that do all the rowing and all that. So, and, and, and even below them, I mean, we've got, we got another 27 people that are every bit as important and do you know phenomenal jobs and they're committed to the to the cause and and that's what makes us great yeah love it what an awesome conversation uh we didn't get quite as deep into clinical but i can't wait for the second (laughs) one so the the leadership stuff is it's so needed i mean we have chiropractors pts everybody's a leader you know if you have a patient in front of you you got to be a leader you gotta you (laughs) you have to there's no other chance and so i I appreciate the insight and i guarantee we'll we'll have another conversation we'll try to keep it a little bit more clinical next time absolutely no it was awesome um all right guys well uh Oh, man, awesome. I, I'm kind of, uh, it was a great conversation and uh, I can't wait to, to have more. So good luck with patience and uh, we'll see you next time. Good luck to the Dimebacks. Yeah, go Dimebacks. Yeah. We need some luck. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.